I don't like the word self-made millionaire because you cannot be a self-made millionaire. A lot of people help you along the way. Uh, if you stop working hard by yourself, others around you will help you. And I always tell my students, like uh, losing one million is almost like uh, buying a membership for wealthy people. Oh. So if you want to become, uh, be in the club of millionaires, you need to lose first million. <laughs> and then after losing about a million dollars, you're welcome to the rich wealthy club. How much is enough? Like how much do I have to make? How do I find the answer to this question? I teach money IQ here and money EQ here. When you think of money, does that bring you a happy feeling or does that bring you like ooh feeling? Ken Honda is a Japanese best-selling author whose books have sold over 8 million copies internationally since 2001. His first English language book, Happy Money, The Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money, is also an international bestseller, inspiring millions and helping them develop a happy and peaceful relationship with money. His latest novel, True Wealth, Nine Lessons from a Grandfather on Happiness and Abundance is another masterpiece that reveals practical strategies to obtain true wealth and a more fulfilling life. Uh, when you have enough uh, security around money, emotionally, and then you don't have to worry about money. And I, I always say money becomes air. Uh, you can breathe in as much as you want and then breathe out as much as you want. But for a lot of people, money is fr frozen ice and you get frozen bites. Because we waste so much time and worry about the right decision. Should I go this path or should I go this path? So if you just trust your guts, trust your int intuition, your life will be 100 times more interesting and also fast too. Hi everyone, welcome back to Aligado Investor. And today I have this honor to be able to invite a super amazing guest. And he is none other than the person who actually inspired me to start this channel called Aligado Investor because he is the person who came up with this very, very beautiful philosophy called Aligado Money. And that is none other than the international best-selling author, Ken Honda. Thank you so much for taking up your time to fly in sing fly to Singapore and meet us and have this interview together. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Chloe and JJ, for inviting me. This thank is you such so a much. Great honor uh, to be able to share what I know about Happy Money, and also um, I have uh, such a huge respect for culture in Singapore. So this is my honor to be here as well. Thank you so much. And thanks, JJ, once again for setting up this amazing space no, so that we are able to meet Ken in person and have this professionally done. Excited <laughs> for this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, Ken, uh, yes. the first question I want to ask you is, you are famous for this book called Happy Money. What exactly is the inspiration behind, like how do you come up with the term happy money and what, what makes this book so special? So, I was born and brought up in a unique family in Kobe, Japan. My father was a successful tax accountant, and he studied uh, teaching me about money since I was five or six. And as I grew up, I just met a lot of people who had money and also a lot of people who didn't have money. He was a tax advisor for um, a lot of wealthy people. And so they, come, uh, they used to come and visit us on weekends. And so um, uh, we were, uh, my sister and my brother uh, were there to greet them. And we kind of knew uh, if the clients uh, are wealthy or not by uh, judging their uh, souvenirs. <laughs> you know, wealthy people bring nice souvenirs like melons and nice ice cream. Yeah. And the poor clients, they sometimes didn't bring anything. So I started witnessing all the wealthy people. And I realized that there are two kinds of people, uh, happy people and also not happy people. Happy people are always smiling and they were very generous. They brought nice gifts for even kids and they treated us very nicely. Whereas uh, unhappy um, people just, uh, they treated us like kids, like almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And also they are very mean. And uh, even as a child, we know that uh, some people are happy and, and others are not. And then I uh, realized that there are two kinds of money too, happy money and unhappy money. That is how I started writing uh, these books. Uh, you mentioned that there was one time um, a, a lady went to your seminar and yes. she actually went to check your wallet. <laughs> yes. And then she went from the wallet, she can get to see whether is your wallet happy or not. Right. So 
how does that experience also inspire you further to to come up with the concept called Happy yes, Money? Yes, yes. I was at the party. I think it's somewhere in Nagoya. And after the seminar, uh, she approached me and she asked me, "Can can I take a look at your wallet?" And I said, "Okay." At the time, the, uh, there were many magazine articles and TV uh, shows about celebrities' wallet. So they interview prime ministers, they interview uh, famous movie stars. Uh, they're asked to bring their wallet and just show what's inside. You know, we're very curious. Like, do they even have a wallet? And uh, so I thought, okay, uh, if you're interested in my wallet, it's okay as long as you give it back to me. <laughs> and I give it uh, to my, uh, give her my wallet. And then I was checking, you know, so she's not going to run away with her, <laughs> with my wallet. And so she pulled all that, uh, the bills, paper money, and then she was checking something. And she was saying, this is good, this is nice, or this is fantastic. And I was uh, looking at her while she's checking something. And she, she put all the money back and gave, it, gave my wallet back to me. And she said, you passed the test. That's congratulations. Like, what, what, what do you mean by that? And she said, all your money was smiling. That means you must have made a lot of people happy and received money. And I can tell uh, what kind of money you receive by looking at your wallet. I said, wow, that's interesting. And she said, on the other hand, if you are taking advantage of other people or if you are doing what you don't like, then your money is crying in your wallet. And I said, okay. mm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking of my friends who have happy, <laughs> smiling money, and also some friends and uncles who don't seem to have a smiling money. And I can really uh, sort my friends um, between the people with happy money, smiling money, and the people with unhappy money. That's what kind of like I got the inspiration to write this book. Is it energy? Like, how do you feel it? How do you feel whether is it happy or sad? So I think, you know, you don't have to be psychic to be able to find out. It's just uh, when you think of money, does that bring you a happy feeling? Or does that bring you like, ooh, feeling? Mm. Uh, even though you're very wealthy, uh, I know a few people who are billionaires, but they are always feeling big stress uh, about running a huge business. So if, even if you are very wealthy, if you have so much stress and lose peace of mind, and then I don't think uh, they are happy people. When you think of money, does your heart open up and feel so happy? Or when you think of money, like you feel squeezed or you feel frustrated. When you think of the bills, oh, I don't want to pay. When you think of taxes, are you feeling like, oh, I'm so happy I can pay so much taxes. You know, that's more advanced level. Whoa. <laughs> wow, that is very interesting. So when you are describing about different feelings towards mm -hmm. money, I know most of the time in the world, mm -hmm. people feel very insecure about it. Yes. That they constantly worry that money is not enough right. and they have this scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. which I have it too. Mm -hmm. So why do you think this is so entrenched into the culture? And how do we overcome that to really think abundantly about money? So first of all, uh, we have to realize that money is tied up with survival in our mind. Uh, like 400 years ago, when everybody was a farmer, we used to grow our own food. We didn't use money, I guess. But uh, about 100 years ago or so, people started uh, dealing with money. So they came into the city. So they have to pay for water. They have to pay for the house and the food. So whatever you do, you need money to survive. So no money, no food, no water, no shelter, and they die on the street. That's what we believe. So when we feel like our money is getting less, and then we feel scared, uh, almost like an instinct uh, is telling us that we have to be, you know, uh, make sure we have to make sure that we have enough money so we can uh, survive. So that is root deeply rooted in in our uh, psychic system, uh, uh, in our emotional system. That's why we worry about money. Mm -hmm. So once you have enough money saved up, uh, when you have enough. Uh, security around money emotionally and then you don't have to worry about money and I, I always say money becomes air uh, you can breathe in as much as you want and then breathe out as much as you want but for a lot of people money is fr frozen ice and you get frozen bites or money could be water but you have to have um, control if the water is running too much it becomes flood when the water is running too low 
that becomes drought. Either way, you have to pay much attention. So uh, unfortunately, 95% of us are in the flow of unhappy money. That's why we feel squeezed or we feel frustrated or we feel worried about the future. Mm. So you talk about this concept called enough, mm -hmm. but how do you ever know that it's enough? Like, for example, right now, you are already so well-to-do. And yet, you are passionate about your work and that's why you continue to do what you do. And at the same time, giving a lot of value and you attract more abundance. But at the same time, you no. Know, sometimes I also feel, I ask myself, how much is enough? Like, how much do I have to make? How do I find the answer to this question? So it's, it's very personal. Um, and if you are just alone, uh, you don't probably need much money. But if you have a family of eight, you may need more money. And if you're living in New York or uh, Singapore or, or uh, London, uh, you may need more money. But if you're living in a, on a countryside, you may uh, need less. So it's up to you how much you need. But uh, what's most important is that uh, your lifestyle and also uh, whatever you want, whenever you want, and whatever, uh, uh, whoever you want to you know, do something uh, your project with. And it doesn't cost so much money when you come to think of it. Um, there are two things about money, stock and flow. You know, you need to have enough stock. Savings. Savings. Mm -hmm. And also you need to have a flow. Okay. So um, even though you have a lot of money, if you don't have any flow, you feel worried. And even if you don't have any money, but if sto uh, flow is constant, probably you worry less. I see. So it's always important to incorporate financial planning that you have savings set aside for rainy days and at the same time still have that flow of income coming in, doing things that you enjoy, that you love, that will make you to be in a peace of mind. Is that, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. So that's why I teach money IQ here and money EQ here. You need to have money in, the, in your bank account and also you need to have a peace of mind with your money. So you need to be free both financially and emotionally. Even if you're fi uh, free financially, uh, if you're not free emotionally, you don't know how much is enough. So for example, if you save up a uh, hundred thousand US dollars, uh, it's more than you need temporarily. But uh, once you save up that much money, all your friends will have more. So then, okay, I have to save up a half a million dollars and then a million dollars and then even if you save up a million dollars, uh, you feel it's not enough. I need to have three million dollars. So, you know, and, and if you save up enough uh, money, then you feel like I need a private jet. <laughs> <laughs> like it's never enough. Yes. So you have to tell yourself how much is enough for yourself. Otherwise, you get stuck in this rat race that I have to do more uh, to get more. The, the tricky part is money of money is that if you make more money, your expenses also will rise too. So if you're making $50,000 a year, your uh, expenses are on that too. Yeah. But if you're making double the income and then $100,000, then your expenses also uh, meeting up too. So unless you have this control, you're always in need for more money at the end of every month. This discipline of knowing when is enough, mm -hmm. it's quite rare because in a world that we are constantly bombarded with so much, you know, information that, that trigger a lot of wants in us, a lot of greed in us, how do you control that greed and really focus appreciating what you have? That's a very good question, Chloe. I think uh, you have to know uh, how to satisfy yourself. In life, there are two important things to make you happy, to go after what you want, and at the same time, uh, enjoy what you receive. So you have to have both. So if you just go after your dreams, you get excited. But at the same time, if you only do that, it's a never ending project. But if you can just satisfy yourself with what you got, what you receive, and then you can enjoy it 100%, and then you become happy. So you need to have a balance between going after what you want and also enjoying what you got. And if you are good at doing both, then you can be very happy with what you got. I felt that the moment you walk into the room, I just feel this sense of peace and happy energy from you. 
how do you cultivate this, you know, zen into your everyday life? Like, are you able to share with us exactly what is your daily routine to have this kind of happiness and grace from you? Uh, before I go to sleep, I always think of a few things, uh, like what uh, kind of uh, fun things or great things that I experienced today. And I always start counting, like, oh, this, this, I did this, I did that. I read a nice book. I watched a nice movie. I met nice people. And also, I always think of the uh, next day. So last night, I was looking at my schedule, and then I'm going to have a very interesting conversation with Chloe and JJ. You know, and I just watched some of your uh, YouTube programs, and then you seem very nice, both of you. Very exciting. So I was kind of like, very excited. Oh, okay, I'm going to have, it's almost like a school trip, you know, the night before. I can't believe, you know, I'm going there. So that kind of excitement is the night before. And when I woke up this morning, of course I knew I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I was coming here. So like I, I, I was very excited to meet both of you. And then just, uh, I, will, I knew I was going to enjoy sharing whatever I have with you. So uh, every moment I find uh, bliss in every little thing. So that's how I live my life. How long have you been practicing that, writing down? I think probably for the past uh, three decades. So, wow. you know, I, I've, I have lived long. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so like, um, it's my almost like daily routine. And, uh, and also, uh, one other thing I do is appreciate uh, whatever happens uh, in that day. And also, I appreciate in advance what I'm going to have on that day. I started appreciating both of you that I'm going to have a good day you know, in the morning. So already in the morning, I feel very happy. Yeah. So. And, and it feels like just now you were replying my email and I saw that cute little child in you say, I'm coming. And then crush, uh, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark three times. I'm like, oh my God, Ken is so cute, like an inner child inside you. How do you continue to nurture that inner child? Because most of the time as we go become adult, we kind of feel worried yeah. and, and the curiosity and the joy just get ripped off, right? Yeah. So how do you have that inner child in you? Yeah, a lot of people say like I'm very child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s, but uh, people think of me as a little child. You know, like I feel like I'm a little puppy because I'm in Singapore, right? I was so fascinated with the shoes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. outside of, you know, the, 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 uh, the apartment, apartment, like to some pictures. So I'm always fascinated with people and, and different culture. So I'm here to learn. I'm here to um, experience. I'm here to make new friends. So that's uh, what I'm very excited about. And, and because, you know, I don't have to make money. You know, most of the things I do uh, for free. And, uh, and sometimes I get paid, sometimes I don't. But it doesn't really matter because I get to enjoy going around the world. I'm, I'm going around the world three times this year. So I start from uh, Helsinki, uh, all the European countries, and go to the States, and then Asia and back to Japan. So um, in the process, I just meet very, very interesting people. And then I can write in solitude. So I talk to thousands of people. Uh, and uh, like, So I, I call myself a busy, busy mouse. <laughs> you know, country mouse, city mouse. So busy mouse. And also in the mountain, I go, I have a retreat center uh, in the mountains. So I become a quiet mouse where I write. So I really enjoy both being surrounded by so many people. And also I enjoy solitude at the same time. Wow. It's always a balance between meeting new people, getting new inspirations and having your own quiet time to condense those inspiration into new value for your audience, for your yes, readers. Yes, And also I'm thinking how we can operate in 2040, you know, like uh, uh, like more than 10, 10 more years from now. How can we deal with money? How, how human beings can cooperate with one another, which we don't be able to, we are not uh, able to do uh, well at this point. But I think in 10 years, I think our world will change. So we need to have a different system so I'm writing a story 
of how we can do that. I know that you are actually publishing a new book called True Wealth, and that is your second English book. Is that correct? Uh, for context, Ken has actually written many, many books in Japan, and he has sold over 8 million copies worldwide, right? So what inspired you to have your second English book published, and what is the inspiration behind True Wealth? Thank you for asking. So this uh, book, True Wealth, is a novel. You know, um, I'm a novelist too. So it's a novel uh, about a grandfather and his grandson. Uh, so one day, this 20-year-old boy, K receives a, a, a package from his grandfather's lawyer. And in the letter, uh, his grandfather writes, I'm so sorry, I'm not, he's a multimillionaire, but he's, he says, uh, you're not going to get uh, any money from me because I donated all that money to charity. But instead, you get nine letters. Enjoy the world. Mm -hmm. And in the package, there are nine letters. And each letter has a title. The first one is synchronicity. The second one is intuition, action, and money, and failure. So each, by opening up one letter, this boy gets guided by synchronicity and goes to Kyoto and other, other cities. So it's a novel about uh, 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 what is important for life. What makes you want to write it in a novel format in t uh, instead of like a self-help book that you do for Happy Money, which is a self-help book? Yes. Right? So I enjoy reading self-help books, but also I love reading books like Alchemist, Celestine Prophecy. Uh, I, I really love uh, story format. And so people can really resonate with stories. That's why I wrote uh, some stories. And this is one of the uh, many that I'm going to translate into uh, English. So uh, my staff is working on translation as well. Because I, I'm actually inside your coaching program, the Happy Money Accelerator program, and you always talk about trusting our intuition. And I think in your uh, upcoming book, True Wealth, you also talk about intuition, right? So. Why do you think it's so important for us to trust our intuition and how do we make better decisions with it? You know, intuition is a guiding system that every one of us has inside. It's almost like a car navigation system. So once you just punch in uh, the, the destination you want to go, then this intuition guides you. So uh, when I talk to thousands of people, I ask my audience um, some questions like, uh, how many of you have felt this is not good, but you went there and then you got into trouble with relationships? You know, I should not date this with this person. <laughs> and then I knew it, I knew it, but you're attracted to the person. So you started dating anyway and you got burned, you know, <laughs> or like an investment. I knew it's not going to be good, but somehow I invested it and then I lost all the money. You know, so I'm sure people have stories like that. So intuition is a guiding force in us that is appropriately guiding your life to, for your happiness. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your system, you know this gut feeling, this is good, this is not. So the only thing, uh, way, uh, very simple way to find out is when you think of a new project, for example, mm -hmm. or meeting somebody or just going overseas, does your heart feel like opening up? this is good, I, I love this, or it's closing down, Ooh, I don't like this. So, you know, it's very simple. You can just feel, when you feel excited, when you feel like, oh, I have to do this, I think I should go, then you should go for it. Like, the thing is, intuition is also something that is uncertain. Yes. How can you be so sure that it will lead to the right outcome? What if it leads to the wrong so outcome? So if you just say, uh, if you are stuck with being right or being wrong, mm -hmm. you get the wrong picture. Exactly. Because, you know, if you take a, a route A, route B, you might end up in the same street. So like say, if, if I take this path, just go for it anyway, and then make the best use of it. And if you take the route B, you just go ahead and just take, make the most of it. Uh, because we waste so much time and worry about the right decision. Should I go this path or should I go this path? In life, you know, just getting married with this person or getting married with this person, it may not make a big difference anyway. But if you just uh, stop there and do nothing for a few years, I think it's a waste of time. So uh, if you just um, 
intuition say, tells you, take A, path A, you should go. And then just um, enjoy your life that way. And if your intuition says B, go for it. And then don't think it's good or bad. Just enjoy your path. So if you just trust your guts, trust your intuition, your life will be 100 times more interesting and also fast too. Wow, I absolutely love that. It's not about, actually it's not about the outcome. It's not about that destination, yes. but about the journey of getting there yes. and experiencing the joy yes. on the journey. Yes, a lot of people, like if, if I just use uh, this analogy as a car, a lot of people put brakes too fast. So that instead of just putting on a gas pedal, they just put on brakes and also side brake too. So, <laughs> so they're stuck in the garage. They never leave the garage. So instead of just going to, a, you know, getting stuck in a garage and wonder, what if I get into a car accident? This is a new baby. You know, I don't want to hurt my car. Uh, and then sh should I go right or should I go left? You know, it doesn't really matter. If you're traveling for two hours, does it really matter if I take a right or take a left? You know, if, if you take the wrong turn, you are always uh, able to take the left or the right. And then if you make like three uh, wrong turns, it's all still okay as long as you keep running. So the biggest mistake is to get stuck and worry and then uh, stop and waste your time. So just keep going and just uh, uh, don't put on brakes, you know, don't use that. So just put on the gas, you know, and then keep going. And then something uh, you'll find on the way. It's like following the intuition, following the flow and see where that brings you to. Yes. So like this interview, I could say no, right? I could, uh, I could stay in a uh, hotel because I'm too afraid. Like, what if I go, go get into a car accident? You know, I don't know uh, if these people may be terrible people, right? I get abducted or... But if you just take a little risk and just, you know, uh, like I, I got an invitation, like, why not? So if your attitude is like that, your life would be a hundred times more exciting. Yes, and I make friends, uh, so many beautiful friends along the way. So I'm very good at connecting, um, connecting my friends. So that's why I'm just finding it so much joy to make friends with European authors and Chinese authors and American authors and Australians and, and um, Indian authors. So I can connect them all. Um, so we can always uh, stay in touch and just make this world a better place. That's beautiful. JJ, you want to have any um, questions? I think I really resonate with what you're saying in terms of like the breaks, right? And I think that it's easy for maybe small decisions like um, coming to this interview, but maybe when it comes to really taking a life-changing decision to start a business, yeah. um, create something for yourself, right? I think that's where even my, I find myself putting many breaks on my end, right? Yes. Uh, when it comes to that decision of making, I'm sure you are also wanting to trust your intuition, uh, intuition. And how do you come to create, like, let's say, decision frameworks, okay? Like, you know you can go A, road A, road B, road C. And what is your thought process when it comes to, hmm, I'm following my intuition, which road should I take? And how do you make that decision? I usually try not to think. Oh, that's interesting. Those yes. Days. Yeah. For like this interview, I didn't know you, right? So instead of just researching who you are, my intuition says yes. Oh, and then you. I follow that. And then here I am. So I usually just uh, make up uh, my own decision with my uh, intuition. So uh, sometimes I say no without any reason. And my staff always ask me, why did you say yes? Or why did you say no? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also very curious because um, when you came in, you actually gave us this gift, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is your pen. Yes. And then this very interesting card uh -huh. that you talk about don't work hard. Mm -hmm. And then people around you will start to help you. Yes. And I think this is very in contrast or contradictory to what we know, right? Mm -hmm. That we know we have to work hard. How do you come up with this? And how has that helped you? So this is actually, um, a, it, it comes from one of my books, the many books. Uh, I asked my readers, uh, which uh, phrase uh, did you love most out of all the hundreds of Ken Honda books? And I got like best 30. So this is one of them. Uh, if you stop working hard by yourself, others around you will help you, is what it says. Mm. 
And well, for example, I started, I, I did a webinar in Barcelona and we got about 3,000 people online, right, for my book launch. And if I try to just call up all my people, like, hey, can you come to my book launch? You know, I could probably get, what, 50 people? But all my friends sent out uh, newsletters, uh, email letters, and then we have that uh, uh, numbers very easily. And I talk to thousands of people all the time on my web seminar and uh, other things. It's because my friends and my uh, readers' friends say, you know, you, you, you have to listen to Ken. And so it's not me selling anything. It's uh, what other people are doing it for me. So if you have a, a big help for other peop- uh, from other people, then you can achieve uh, so many great things. For example, I sold uh, more than 8 million b- books, right? I didn't physically uh, sell the books. I sold two books, you know, at my si- book signing event. You know, people are so busy. So I was at, you know, helping them. So I probably sold two books and with, in my 20 career, years career. All the other 8 million some books are sold by somebody at the bookstore. So they helped me do this. And also people, uh, the truck drivers, delivered all the books to the bookstores. The printers, they printed my books. And so the editors and the, the publisher people, you know, they all helped me. So uh, I don't like the word self-made millionaire because you cannot be a self-made millionaire. A lot of people help you along the way. So that's, that's something I really I'll always appreciate every day. I can totally see that when I was reading your book, Happy Money, that you talk about the importance of relationship. And there's one quote that really struck me is, um, you know, I think one person asked you, oh, what if today you lose all your money? And then you say, well, I know my friends will take care of me. And I'm like, wow, this is a different level of trust that you have in your friend and How do you cultivate that trust in people and believing that they will be there for you when you need help? Because I have been helped by so many people in the past. So I have, I have many friends that I will do anything to help my friends. You know, I can just, you know, uh, put on all my money for my friends. So, uh, there are several people who are like that. And there are hundreds of others that I have helped along the way. So when I was helped, I always feel like uh, I need to do something to pay back whatever the thing they did for me. So if I have, uh, if I feel that way, you know, from the other side, they feel the same way for me. Mm-hmm. I have helped hundreds and thousands of people in my life. And so they're going to make sure to, so that uh, when I fall, they will be here to catch me. So that's why I feel like uh, I, even if I lose everything, I'm not worried because I can visit my friend number one and just ask him to stay, let me to stay for one week. And I can do the second friend with second week. And there are only 50 weeks in a year. And I have more than 50 friends. <laughs> so after about a year, I can come back to my friend number one. It's been a year. How are you? <laughs> can I stay with you for one more week? So by doing that, I am financially free. People say, oh, I don't have 50 friends. So you can do the same thing with 12 friends. Just you need to ask them to let you stay for one month. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as you have 10 friends, you're okay. Once you have that attitude, you don't uh, worry about money. Because it's not about money. It's about your future you worry about. Mm. You know, like uh, we are not worried about money. We are worried about the situation when we have no money and then we'll be in trouble. But what if, even though we have no money, if somebody, um, your friends or your family members, will be there to help you, then you have no problem. That really give me a lot of peace. Yes. So instead of uh, having so much money in the bank account, I have so many uh, people who would help me. So, uh, and also, especially these days, I'm, I'm just uh, treating young people for lunch and dinner. And then, uh, you know, I, I give them a lot of advice for free. So I'm just telling them, you are my pension plan. <laughs> <laughs> so in the future, when I go old and lose all the money, can you take care of me? And say, of course, you know. So I have a lot of pension plan too. Wow. So I don't need money. I have nice 20 young people who will be successful. So as long as I have uh, 20 people, you know, young people who support me, I have nothing to worry about. You know, these days you cannot depend on kids, you know. 
And if your kid doesn't do well, you have nobody to depend on. But if you just help 20 people who are successful, you're all good. Mm, it's about planting that seed and giving first. Yes. And because they really feel how genuine you are in yeah. helping them, uh -huh. they will reciprocate when you need help. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. So like say 20 years from now, when I just reach like 70s or 80s, and if I have no money, I can say, help. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Honda needs help. <laughs> And then, I'm sure people will rush to help you. Yeah, so like people, some people may bring, you know, uh, rice or like Chinese Chinese dish or Chinese tea or whatever that is, you know. So I, I have a hundred percent trust that people will help me when I'm in need. That's why I'm not worried about money. And I can see you have accumulated so much wisdom along the years to really cultivate that Zen, that peace, that happy money. How about in the past? Like, did you ever make any mistakes before that money mistake that yes. you, you and, and then what did you learn from it? I, I, I've lost a lot of money. You know, I think probably at least I, lo I have lost about more than one million US dollars. And I always tell my students like uh, losing one million is almost like uh, buying a membership for wealthy people. Oh, so if you want to become uh, be in the club of millionaires, you need to lose first million. <laughs> and then after losing about a million dollars, you're welcome to the rich wealthy club. So you need to make a lot of mistakes. You learn from those mistakes. So by learning from the mistakes or the, the loss you take, then you are smarter. So you, ha you have to be ready to lose money and you have to be ready to make mistakes. And then <clears throat> if you know you're ready, um, you're all set. Before I published my um, first English book, I asked my mentors in uh, English and I asked, what are the chances of just getting sued in America? Mm. You know, mm. <laughs> and, and he said, if you become super successful, uh, 200%. Oh. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And uh, how much uh, do I get sued for? And, you know, they sued for ridiculous things. But if you just ready... Uh, uh, to pay for it, it's usually like less than $20,000 or uh, $5,000 or $10,000 because lawyers are harassing you, right? So, so I said, okay, so if I have $100,000, um, would that be enough? And I said, yeah, temporarily. So I just saved up enough $100,000 for like uh, a rescue fund <laughs> in case I get sued, right? And then I, I, I have saved up that much money so even if I get sued, I'm not worried because I have the money already. So once I have the main, main attitude, I have nothing to worry about. So my uh, life has been uh, very colorful with so many mistakes. That's why I became wealthy. And that's why I don't have to worry about money because you know when I need money, I can make money very easily too. And also if I lose everything, I can ask my friends, please. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, it's learning from all those mistakes. The mistakes make you who you are today. Yes. Make you better each time. Yes. And the relationship make you even stronger. That yes. That is so beautiful. Yeah. So uh, if you're in your 20s, you have to lose your first $100,000. And if you want to be a millionaire, you have to lose your first million in order to become a multimillionaire. So, but if you're ready to lose the first million, and then you can just go wild. And if you're just worried if this is the right move or not, then you cannot go anywhere, so. Wow, and I also remember there is uh, one time that you talk about back then when you're very young in your early 20s, you actually went to the US, you have this very deep connection with the people in the US because they yeah. were super kind to you. Right. Right, can you share with us a little bit more about it and how, how has kindness helped you? So, you know, the reason why I'm not worried about money is I have this experience one year from 19 to age 20, I was in North America and I was in the United States. I started my journey from Boston. I ended, I, I ended up in Florida. And meanwhile, I just traveled all around across the uh, US uh, by the kindness of American people. So I met up with a stranger and uh, they let me stay for them, with them for a week, sometimes a month. And uh, so I totally depended on people's generosity. My mentor at the time, when I was 19, uh, he said, um, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be dependent on other people. And the uh, real dependency is to go 
travel with no money and just ask for help, just uh, total surrender. And I thought, oh, okay. And, and, and okay, and I did it. So I didn't spend any money, just uh, depended on people's kindness for one year. And totally, I just um, ask, uh, can I stay? You know, I have no money. And I, I, I went to a, a park and then, you know, I always found somebody, uh, like a lonely uh, old people who was just feeding the pigeon. And, and just, I became friends with them. And then I always ask, uh, can you recommend the cheapest restaurant in here? And then said, okay, I'm going to buy you lunch. And then we engaged in a conversation for two or three hours. It's getting darker. And they said, can you recommend any cheap hotel? You can stay with me. <laughs> so by doing that, you know, I'm very good at uh, staying with uh, people's houses. That's why I was jo- half joking. Can I, can I stay with you for one week? You know, I can stay like a ninja. You know, I can just completely stay uh, invisible. So I can sleep on the couch without making a sound. <laughs> so people don't mind having me in the house. So I'm very good at doing that, you know, and I just clean the house, change the light bulbs, you know, I do everything. So uh, uh, at, by the end of my stay, all the host members say, you know, Ken, please don't go. <laughs> I need you to stay. My bathrooms are so clean, you know, our fridge is so beautiful. So can you stay another week? So I acquired the skills of depending on people's generosity. That's why I'm not afraid of losing uh, all the money. That is so transformational. Yes, that- yeah. So I, I trust people's uh, generosity. You know, even though there are some bad people, I know that, but uh, there are still um, people who are uh, generous, kind, you know, caring. I, I, I still trust humanity in that sense. And moving forward, um, as you are doing, continue to do what you are doing right now, what is your next vision that you want to achieve for yourself? So for me, I want to travel around the world and help people transform their relationship with money. Sometimes I get paid, sometimes I don't. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to uh, go to places as long as I'm invited. Uh, so I'm thinking of going to Eastern Europe or India and Africa and uh, Arabic countries, wherever, um, uh, whoever wants to invite me, I'll be there. So at least for the next three years. And then uh, when I reach 60, I, I may retire for whatever I do, and just start a new life. And you have lived, I think, close to 50 years mm-hmm. of your life. Yes. If you can think about one moment that you just felt, oh, I'm so happy I did it. I'm so grateful that I made that decision. What was that? So I think probably the most unique thing I did is retire from my baby girl. My wife and I found out that she was pregnant and we decided to have some time off. So uh, I thought it's for t- uh, two or three weeks, but my wife thought it's two years. <laughs> and then after about having two months off of my schedule, we realized that we can have a longer time off. So we ended up spending four years for a baby girl. So uh, I could witness my baby st- stood up, started uh, speaking, started singing. You know, all those first time I was there to witness. So uh, not many fathers uh, can afford to do that. So uh, that is my secret uh, joy and abundance that I could experience. And what has your girl taught you as she grows up and you beside her? What's the greatest lesson that she's taught? she has taught you? So she is a source of uh, my inspiration. If she was not there, I would never study writing books because um, she um, uh, really uh, helped me uh, find out who I am and also what I want to leave the world. If I, I was single and didn't have uh, a family, I think uh, probably didn't uh, write that many books. And I was always inspired to help my daughter um, in the future. So all the books I wrote for her. So even if I'm gone, she can just read some of my books and then just uh, um, learn the wisdom uh, from my books, uh, even though I'm not, I'm not there with her. Wow, I'm very sure that she is very proud to have you as father, you know, always guiding her along her way. And we are almost wrapping up this interview. 
if you have one final advice to give to our audience here to help them to lead a richer, wiser, happier life, what would that be? Do what you love, enjoy money, and when you're afraid, jump in <laughs> and then take a risk. And that way, you have more exciting life. Enjoy money. Enjoy money. Yes, money is there for you to enjoy life. Wow. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. And if our audience wants to find out more about your work, your、mm-hmm. upcoming books, where can they find more information about it? So you can find all the information at kenhonda.com, and, and, and all the information is there. I'm, I'm, I'm translating a lot of stuff、uh, for the website, and I'm studying.、Uh, Yeah, new English community, and also、uh, one in Chinese and one in Spanish as well. So, hopefully, I can teach in many languages. We'll be looking forward to that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'm very sure that you will enjoy the next episode here where JJ he actually interviewed Ken and really d o c u m e n t down the whole entire process of him becoming a very, very famous author. Exactly what are his advice for people who aspire to be an author? And on top of that, additional tips to help you to become more successful in life as well. So make sure to check out the video right here and keep. Keep learning from Ken, and I will see you in the next video. Arigato!